God has made Christ our righteousness and sanctification, which means that those who belong to Christ not only avoid condemnation, but they also live by the Spirit, not by the flesh. These two points sum up the gospel. There's no stronger reason to live a holy life than this. There is no condemnation for you. And nothing shows more clearly that someone has escaped condemnation than living by the Spirit. We've talked a little about how a person's actions and the Spirit's work in them reveal their condition. Now we'll discuss how these two things come together and how this freedom from condemnation leads to living by the Spirit, not by the flesh. When God created humans, He made them with both a soul and a body. The soul was meant to be in charge, guiding the body in a way that honored God. The soul could connect with spiritual things, while the body was more like the animals on earth. But when sin entered the world, it ruined this order. Sin caused humans to rebel against God, and instead of the soul ruling over the body, the body, or flesh, took control. This is the punishment for Adam's sin. Adam, who was supposed to obey God, chose instead to follow his senses. He saw the fruit was good, and he ate it. This sin reversed the natural order, making the flesh rule over the soul. Now, humans are often controlled by their physical desires, rather than their soul's connection to God. In fact, people who aren't saved by Christ are called flesh, because their lives are led by their bodily desires, not by God's Spirit. Even the best parts of a person's mind, like their thoughts and understanding, are still influenced by the flesh. Nothing can overcome the power of the flesh until the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life. Sin has destroyed the image of God in humans, but when someone is regenerated or born again, the Holy Spirit comes and restores order. The flesh is no longer in control. The soul, under God's law, takes its rightful place. Christ repairs what sin has broken and gives people a new way to live, following the Spirit instead of the flesh. Christ is the ultimate friend to humanity. While sin made us act like animals, Christ makes us truly human again. People without faith in Christ are often described as unreasonable or beast-like in the Bible because they're ruled by their passions. But faith restores reason and self-control. Christians are called to be more than just conquerors of the world. They must conquer their own fleshly desires. Christ has set believers free from the power of sin, and they must live according to that freedom. We as Christians must live by the Spirit, not by the flesh. The world lives according to the flesh, which is why we see so much sin around us, drunkenness, anger, envy, and more. But Christ doesn't allow room for such behaviors in his kingdom. While sinners can be forgiven and accepted into Christ's kingdom, they must give up their sinful ways. Christ cannot keep both the sinner and the sin. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. The flesh may seem like your friend, but it will ultimately lead you to destruction. It's a blind guide that will lead you away from heaven. Instead, come to Jesus, who offers a new guide, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will lead you to truth, eternal life, and back to heaven. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and the Spirit will guide you through this journey from grace to glory. All of our lives as Christians must be centered on Christ because there is no other way to heaven. We shouldn't interpret this too narrowly, as if only the worst sins are examples of living by the flesh. While those major sins can certainly keep many from being in Christ, the concept also includes the thoughts and desires of an unrenewed spirit and the common ways people live. In Colossians 3 and Galatians 5, the Apostle lists various works of the flesh and traits of the old self, some of which we might not even consider sinful, things like anger, wrath, and greed. How many people among us experience these things? Many of us are driven by greed, our hearts focused on the world rather than heavenly treasures. Even in our normal jobs and efforts, we often work with selfish motives, which are marked by the flesh and have no value before God. We can see how common sin is. Anger often controls people, yet it's taken lightly. But Scripture condemns it, calling it foolishness. This foolishness comes from our natural sinful nature, and it often leads to hatred and malice, showing more of the devil's influence than simple human weakness. Even if a person isn't prone to these sins, pride and self-love are in everyone. This includes those who seem humble or polite. If we could closely watch our hearts, we'd see how often we seek praise and approval or how our pride flares up when we feel insulted. 
This pride, deeply rooted in us, is the very sin that led to humanity's fall. Pride grows in all places, whether in palaces or in poverty. It even hides in false humility. Ultimately, whether through ambitious desires, the pursuit of earthly things, an inflated view of ourselves, or uncontrolled emotions toward inappropriate things, we all fall into these sins. Every person has an idle or dominant desire. Some people focus on external pleasures and gain, while others are proud of their talents or abilities, but both are equally sinful before God. There are two common mistakes people make about living spiritually. One is a false teaching some promote today, and the other is a practical mistake many of us fall into. Some people, claiming to have deep spiritual insights about Christ and the Spirit, end up confusing spiritual living with just a more refined version of living by the flesh. They separate the Spirit from God's Word, treating the Bible and God's law, which guided King David, as outdated or unimportant. But Isaiah says, if they don't speak according to the law and testimony, there's no light in them. So this so-called new light is actually just old darkness. If someone's teachings don't line up with the Bible, it's a sign they don't have the Spirit. Isn't it the Spirit, the Comforter, that Jesus promised to the apostles and to all who believe in him through their message? The Spirit is the Spirit of truth, leading us into all truth. Jesus warned that the Spirit wouldn't bring new teachings, but would remind us of everything he had said. That's why the Apostle Paul told the Colossians to let the Word of Christ live in them richly, teaching one another with wisdom. The Spirit doesn't replace God's Word. It works in harmony with it. The Spirit that Jesus sent doesn't make us disregard the commandments or God's truth, but helps us overcome sin and our sinful nature. It's a mistake to think that subduing grace and obedience to God's Word is a victory. Anyone can do that, even those controlled by sin. Just like people fell from grace by trying to reach too high, those who think they're above Christ's teachings and the apostles, message may be in danger of falling away from Jesus entirely. It's true that the letter of the law alone brings death, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, but the Spirit gives life. However, separating the Spirit from the Word is also dangerous. Without the Spirit, the Word cannot bring life, and without the Word, we lose our standard of truth. David understood this balance. He prayed, Give me life according to your Word, and your Spirit is good. Lead me in righteousness. The Word was his guide, and the Spirit applied it to his heart. The Word shows us the pattern we should follow, but it's the Spirit that transforms us to match that pattern. Without the Word, we wouldn't know what God expects of us. And if we only rely on our own inner experiences and ignore the Word, we're following an incomplete and imperfect guide. Some people make the mistake of believing they don't need to strive for more holiness than they already have. They think they've reached spiritual perfection. But Paul didn't think that way. He kept pressing forward, never satisfied with where he was in his spiritual journey. We should not trust every spirit or teaching that comes in the name of spirituality. Jesus warned us about this. Instead, we should pray for more of the Spirit to bring God's Word to life in us and help us obey it. The Word and the Spirit must work together. The Spirit brings the Word alive, and the Word gives us the truth we need to follow. The Word is like a seed, but it can't grow new life in us unless the Spirit works in our hearts. The Word is our standard and the Spirit is our guide who helps us live according to it. Peter also made this connection between the Word and the Spirit. Jesus said, You are clean through the Word I have spoken. And Peter added that it's the Spirit that purifies us by working through the truth of the Word. The Spirit of God doesn't need a pattern to follow, but we do. Without it, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the truth and a lie. We test the spirits by comparing them to God's Word. It's by looking closely at the pattern of Christ's life and the truth in the Word that the Spirit transforms us to be like Jesus. Anything else, anything based on our own ideas or desires, is a form of living by the flesh. And living that way can never please God, especially when we refuse to listen to His will. Like all other false teachings, this mistake is just another work of the flesh. Another common belief among many of us is that being spiritual means avoiding the obvious sins of the world and living in a way that seems blameless to others. 
Many people think that if they appear good to the world, they must be walking in the Spirit. But don't be fooled. Just because you look good in the eyes of others doesn't mean you're spiritual. You can be outwardly respectable and still be living according to the flesh. Think about it. Do you believe drunkenness, impurity, and other obvious sins are walking in the Spirit? The Holy Spirit purifies us from all these things. So, if your life is full of these behaviors, or if you don't care about reading and meditating on the Scriptures, how can you claim to be walking in the Spirit? If you are constantly filled with anger, jealousy, greed, and other such sins, then it's clear you're living according to the flesh, not the Spirit. How can you think you're a Christian if these are the things that define your life? Even if you avoid these outward sins and have a form of religion, this still doesn't prove you're walking in the Spirit. Being spiritual means living according to the Spirit, not just doing visible acts of worship. The body can take part in religious activities, but that alone doesn't make you a Christian. Many people place their confidence in outward religious acts, but if they looked into their hearts, they would find vanity and little thought of God. We may give God a quick morning or evening prayer, but then spend the rest of the day without much thought of Him. Is that truly walking in the Spirit? Walking in the Spirit means being consistent in our devotion to God, even when we are not formally praying. We need to ask ourselves whether our souls are as involved in our spiritual lives as our bodies are. How often are our conversations and thoughts filled with things that don't help us spiritually or glorify God? Much of our time is wasted on things that don't matter. Our thoughts often wander aimlessly, avoiding God. If our service to God is truly spiritual, it should come from the heart, filled with affection and devotion. Otherwise, we are like empty shells, Christian in appearance, but lacking the life and soul that comes from truly.